ride on board the hybrid diesel electric city bus. Learn about career training to succeed in the workforce. And you can see this in the All of this on kids, machines, and careers. can reach uh, into the um, the bowl of, of this uh, of the scraper. Now you have a 12D71 Detroit engine uh, powering the front unit and also the uh, 671 that powers the uh, the, uh, the rear that's the rear engine. That powers the back wheel or the back axle. site here, they had a blast drilled down into this hard rock, what they call basalt. 
and, uh, and they use a machine here. This is what they call a track drill uh, drilling machine. Look at that down there. This is where they have a drill. They use that machine over there, that track drill machine. And that machine, you can see the rod. The rod is spinning and it's drilling down. Once they drill down to such a depth, then they actually um, drop dynamite and sticks down. And then they fill the hole and then they charge it. So, as you can see, they're removing the earth. All this layer of basalt rock, volcanic rock, they're removing it with this uh, huge uh, excavator. And uh, they're using scrapers instead of the uh, dump trucks. All of this rock here is all the soft.
Well, we're on a non-code call at Davis Pizza. And we're here to visit with Terry Catfield again to learn about popping and drafting. Let's listen in. All right. Well, hey, this is an old pumper. Same as an engine. It's called a pumper engine. And in the old days, they didn't have a lot of fire hydrants around. So they had to use water from wherever, wherever they could get it. And that's what these hoses are used for. They're called heart suction. And they would put these hoses on the pump here and put the end of the hose down in the water, the river, a lake, uh, maybe a, a pond that they would build with water. And the pump would actually suck the water. There are actually two pumps here. One is a drafting pump. And what that does is it sucks the air out and it allows water to come up into the hose until it gets into the pump. And then the pump from the engine starts pushing the water out into the hoses. And that continues the suction process. It allows the water to keep going from there. How can I, how can I illustrate that? You know, I've got a perfect idea of how to illustrate this whole concept for you. We're here at David's Pizza. Let's go in and I'll show you what I got in mind. So what I was talking about out of the fire truck, drafting the water up so that the pump could uh, pump it out, is exactly the same thing you do when you're drinking uh, Pepsi through a straw. In fact, let's just do a competition with that right now. I've been waiting. Where is that server anyway? I've been waiting for our Pepsis here. There he is. <laughs> well, Jerome. Hey, you know I change position, you know? I'm a jack of all trades. It's good to have a job where you learn a trade. But know? it's not something, you know, you gotta you know you gotta be able to do whatever you can. Anything else I can get for your table? I think we're set, friend. Alright. Thank you. Enjoy yourself. You will. Alright. Okay, so grab your Pepsis. Uh, actually, uh, you two over here. And when I say ready, set, go, we're going to see who can draft as much pop as possible. Yeah? As much as do. That's the winner, the one that gets the most. Are you guys ready? All right, on three. One, two, three. And just like in the drafting pump, as they suck up the uh, air out of the straw, the air pushing down on the pop pushes the pop up into the straw and into the mouth. And that's drafting. I think we're just about getting to a winner here. He's going, he's going, he's going. Oh, oh, now we got another one coming on strong. Who's going to draft the most? Who's going to draft the fastest? <laughs> All right, we have a winner by default. <laughs> Good job. water on the fire there we go there you have a chance to see the plane dropping uh, water I'm on the uh, South Hill on the uh, uh, Manitou Boulevard and uh, High Drive we have Station 18 uh, they're running uh, some hose lines from the hydrant uh, pumping from the truck and uh, those lines will go on down to uh, where the fire scene is at down the bottom of the hill. Uh, several fire units are on scene at this time uh, to uh, try to contain this uh, wildland fire uh, in this residential neighborhood. So I uh, stand by as I continue on down the road and I uh, get uh, closer and more development of this uh, fire. We have uh, engine 81, uh, station uh, 6, Spoke, uh, Spokane Fire Department. Uh, again, this is this uh, brush truck, Spokane uh, City Fire. We have uh, Department of Natural Resources on scene at this point, and as well as uh, several other fire units as we continue to walk down this uh, roadway. We have Spokane uh, Fire Department Station 9. Again, we have several units uh, responding to this location. As we uh, continue on, Station 4 at the location. Uh, the uh, area is pretty well uh, cordoned off of traffic. 
you can be able to see uh, a number of people are out on the lawn and determining whether they're going to have to evacuate. We have uh, AMR uh, in case of there's uh, an event of an emergency, medical emergency on scene. District 8 uh, incident response. District 8 incident support unit is on scene to uh, make sure that uh, the firefighters are taken care of. They have some uh, cool drinks and uh, this is a place where they can come here to uh, uh, cool off and kind of take a breather. Again, that's uh, District 8 incident support unit. You can see another airplane coming down. Drop another. There he goes. With his location. Uh, this is the uh, command post for the uh, firefighters. And there are several uh, departments involved with uh, extinguishing this uh, this fire uh, is pretty much contained right now. Uh, they're going to do a, they're going to be involved with mop up at this point uh, to check for hot spots and uh, make sure that everything is safe. So they're going to be here through uh, the evening uh, to make sure the fire is extinguished completely, including hot spots. So stand by. Here with the uh, chief uh, Bobby Williams. Uh, Chief uh, Williams, we have here. This is a command post, and uh, this is where most of the, everything is run with the incident. So we take fires like that are this size, and we break them into divisions. So we have a lower division and this fire that's working from below. We have an east division and a west division that are working on structural protection up here. So um, the incident commander manages all that. So and we, we have what we call. That's wonderful. Well, you heard it from Chief Bobby Williams from the Spokane City Fire Department here in Spokane, Washington. So we're going to take his advice to stay uh, within the, uh, the containment area. And uh, I can see that the fire is uh, pretty much, uh, is this in the uh, salvaging stage now? Well, yeah, or? we're going to be in mop up. So we'll be in mop up. up. We'll probably do I tonight and all, all day tomorrow as well. We'll have to do this Okay, and so uh, at this point, there's no real need for evacuation. Not pretty no, much, we'd, uh, we'd ask uh, people earlier to leave, uh, uh, and most everybody cooperated if they felt like they needed to. We had some areas up here where the fire got within the hundred foot of the hole, wow. so uh, it got pretty close. Yeah, uh, but the, the, the whole crews worked very, very hard and uh, made, made sure the fire didn't get to any of those. Well, my friend, thank you. it's a pleasure, nice to see you. and thank you for coming on camera with yeah, us. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, I'm in, uh, I changed location. I'm in the back of uh, the residence. Uh, they allow me to, to be able to uh, go to the back of the house. As you can see, you see the uh, highway out there. That's a 195 going to uh, Pullman. And as you can see down below, that uh, there's still fire. They have a ground crew on right now. And so you can actually see uh, flames there. Uh, Sometimes it often picks up quite a, you know, pretty fast, even though that they're in the mop-up stage. But they have a ground crew right now that's on this uh, fire trying to tackle. I can see some of the firefighters actually coming up the hill side and uh, checking for hot spots. Okay, we're out front here. Um, kind of signing off Students, young adults, what are your choices regarding employment before and after graduation? Are you a career seeker? 
Would you like to know more about opportunities available in the construction and earth moving industries? Don McKenzie, Director of Apprenticeship Programs of the Inland Northwest General Contractors, will give us some constructive insight about recruitment and training. Follow me. Let's start by giving you a little bit of information about apprenticeship. Apprenticeship is an educational model that has been around since about the 12th century, where craftspeople have passed on what they know about the particular craft or, or uh, that they are involved in. They pass those techniques and those, uh, those methods on to other people through what's called apprenticeship. So you have an apprentice. Uh, Apprentice craft people that learn while they're working in the, in, the, uh, in the field how to do whatever craft they're doing. And so it's been around for a very, very long time. It's been um, pretty much championed by organized labor here in the United States as a methodology to help people uh, learn uh, a particular craft. Most apprenticeships last about four years. The nice thing about apprenticeship is that you're actually earning money while you're going to school. Okay, where in most situations you go to school and you pay, you pay uh, the institution to get the education that you're getting. And so, uh, as you complete four years, you have a marketable skill, all right? And you receive a journeyman card that identifies you as a skilled craftsperson in whatever craft that you've chosen to apprentice in. And now you are a journeyman in that craft. You've already demonstrated that you have acquired the skills that, have, that make up that particular craft, whether it's carpentry or plumbing or electric, electrician or whatever it has to be, heavy equipment operator, wherever that is. Okay, what does it take? What does it take to be involved in, a, in the construction industry or get into my apprenticeship programs, okay? You gotta be 18 years old, okay? You gotta have uh, reliable transportation and driver's license. Yeah. You gotta have a high school diploma, all right? Those are the four things that you need to do that the minimum requirements that you have to meet in order to get into my apprenticeship programs and most apprenticeship programs. If you don't have a high school diploma or a GED, you're not gonna be able to master the thought process that's necessary for you to succeed, all right, in, in this industry. The image that the trades are for people who can't succeed in higher education is, is, is not true, okay? It takes very smart people to do these kinds of jobs. It takes very intelligent, smart people to succeed in construction. So, what does it take to succeed? I gave you the minimifications. I'm going to tell you what five things I believe are necessary for people to succeed in the construction industry. We can teach people the skills, okay? We can teach you how to be a carpenter, how to be a, a pipe fitter, how to be an electrician, how to be an equipment operator, whatever it happens to be. We teach you those skills. All right, these five things, they come from in here, all right? Here it is, and this is, this is almost embarrassingly simple, okay? Embarrassingly simple, okay, here we go. Five things, you gotta get to work every day, on time, got to work all day and powerball you got to know the difference between a job done and a job done right uh, so you have a job you've got a career you've got a marketable skill uh, that can be that you can take anywhere in the country anywhere in the world to use and with a little bit of discipline because you've been paid a decent wage a family wage all this time while you're learning well, you've probably got money in the bank. So there doesn't take much of a mathematician to figure out the economics of these educational models, you know, and which one is more, more beneficial than the other, all right? There's only four out of 100 college graduates. Those are people that graduate from school, not the ones that just go. But only four out of 100 college graduates will ever earn as much in their lifetimes as a skilled craftsperson. Our educational system hasn't really informed people about the options that are out there in the skilled trades, all right? And the earning potential that is part of that whole scenario. So, and you can see just from the difference 
in terms of, uh, of the economics of those educational models, why that might be true. I don't care what it is you want to tackle in your lifetime. If you get to work every day, on time, okay, work hard all day long, and do a good job, you're going to succeed. You're going to succeed. And certainly in the construction industry, that's going to be the case. Well, by evident of the uh, audience, certainly we appreciate your your fine uh, presentation and bring this information to us. Don, it is a pleasure. Thank you, very much. Thank, you, thank you very much. These are questions that young people ask and are certainly beneficial for everyone. suburban service. As you can see, there's only one door here. Now, the suburban bus, different from a, a city bus, these coaches were designed for a suburban route schedule. electric bus. This walk around here and take a look uh, at this coach. We have an elevated uh, wheel car. So uh, let's board the bus and uh, learn more about the, uh, the electrical propulsion system. The electric motor in the transmission will produce a uh, AC current. That current runs from the transmission it goes up to uh, the top of this bus here underneath this uh, roof here and they have what they call a uh, dual-powered inverter modular. Uh, in other words, a uh, deep pimp. The modular up above uh, is a dual converter. So it converts uh, AC into DC. So underneath here, as I mentioned, is you have uh, an inverter. That's your deep pimp, dual-powered inverter modular, AC and also a DC inverter. Now DC is a direct current. The, the direct current, once it's uh, uh, converted from uh, AC to DC, the DC current is then stored in the, uh, in the battery pack. Uh, the battery pack is a nickel metal hydride battery pack system. Now, once the bus accelerates from the curve, that energy is being, will be reused to transfer back to AC, which then accelerates the bus. We're going to learn more about the electrical propulsion system of hybrid uh, buses. The noise level of a hybrid bus outside the coach it's probably about no more difference than an average automobile. So let's go on board and uh, let's watch as the driver operate this coach. I have a, a vintage bus driver change machine. I have to credit this change machine to my friend uh, Doug in Libby, Montana. All right, well, we're inside uh, the 40-foot Gillick hybrid bus. 
post number 8006, uh, heading back to uh, Spokane, uh, Bay uh, Spring Avenue. Notice uh, the coach, the very clean, comfortable coach, as you can see, uh, a hybrid bus. Uh, this is quite a smooth ride. The uh, coach here, Quiet. I'm sure passengers enjoy riding on a quiet bus. So as the bus accelerates from the curve, it's actually using that regenerative uh, braking energy. Now when the bus stops, it slows down, that electrical energy at that point will go back through the system and then go through the dual power converter modular and then it'll be transferred to DC direct current and that energy is stored in the battery. Now wait, now as you can see the driver is accelerating. When he accelerates, he's reusing that power again. So the bus can stop and go as often as it wants. It's just, all it's doing is that it is making uh, electricity for the bus to accelerate as well as to the energy to stop. But watch the, as we watch the driver, uh, you, you can see the car that's ahead of the bus. Uh, we're going to watch as when he stops this bus, we're going to notice that he's not really uh, applying great pressure on the surface brake. As you can see, now the bus is actually slowing down on its own. He's not even uh, using the, the, the service brake. And uh, as he continues to accelerate, watch again now. As you can see, the only really need to use the service brake is to apply the firm pressure just to stop, you know, sudden. Most of your braking. Really, it's, uh, it's used by the, uh, the regenerative system. Well, we enjoyed our uh, stay here in Spokane with the Spokane Transit Authority. I hope you enjoyed the show. Join me for the next Learning by Curiosity Kids, Machines and careers. See you later.